In April of 2006, a stray 9mm bullet killed a two-year-old child after a street fright fight in the Bronx. Eyewitnesses described the shooter as wearing a blue shirt or sweater. Police officers determined that Ronell Gilliam was involved and that Nicholas Morris had been at the scene. A search of the apartment revealed a 9mm cartridge and three 357 caliber bullets. Gilliam initially identified Morris as the shooter, but he subsequently said that Daryl Hemphill, Gimmel's cousin, was the shooter. Not crediting Gil Gilliam's recitate, re recantation, the state charged Morris with the child's murder and possession of 9mm handgun. In a subsequent plea deal, the state agreed to dismiss the murder charges against Morris if he pled guilty to a new charge of possessing a 357 revolver, a weapon that had not killed the victim. Years later, the state indicted Hempfill for the child's murder after learning that Hempfill's DNA matched a blue sweater found in Gilliam's apartment shortly after the murder. After the trial, Hempfill elicited undisputed testimony from a prosecution witness. The police had recovered a 9mm ammo from Morris's apartment, thus pointing to Morris as the culprit. Morris was not available to testify at the Hempfill trial because he was outside the United States. Relying on People v. Reed and over the objection of Hemphill, the trial court allowed the state to introduce parts of the transcripts of Morris's plea allocation, allocution to the 357 gun possession charge as evidence to rebut Hemphill's theory that Morris committed the murder. The court reasoned that although Morris's out-of-court statements had not been subject to cross-examination, Hemphill's arguments and evidence had opened the door an admission of the statements was reasonably necessary to correct a misleading impression that Hemphill had created. The state, in its closing argument, cited Morris's plea allocution and emphasized that possession of a 357 revolver, not murder, was the crime Morris committed. The jury found Hempful guilty. Both the New York Appellate Division and the Court of Appeals confirmed. Okay, so what we've got is two people involved in a potential murder relating to a child. One of them pleads guilty to simple possession of a 357 revolver. Initially charged with murder, but he makes a plea deal. And he pleads to 357, which isn't the bolt that killed the child, but that's what we got. Some time later, the other person is now the suspect. We found DNA on the sweater, a sweater that looks like the sweater of the day. And we found 9mm ammo and so forth. So we have some evidence that suggests that he's involved. Now, what we want to do is we want to offer the statement of the other guy who had previously confessed to possession of the 357 revolver to dispel some of the claims that are being made by this defendant. So that we want to say, oh, wait, no, that he's saying some things, but here's an allocution we want to argue against that, that, that pushes against it. Now, we can't get to the guy. He's not available, but we're going to try to issue his allocution. The problem, of course, being that he's not available for cross-examination. So it's an out-of-court statement made by someone else and not him, but it's being used against him and without the ability to confront your witnesses. This seems pretty suspect. All right, so let's give this a shot, see what happened. The trial court's admission of the transcript of the plea allocution over Hempfill's objection violated his Sixth Amendment right to confront witnesses. This is this is totally correct, right? Uh, Morris plead, pled guilty to possession of a 357 revolver. His plea is admissible against him, but there's no connection. They're not co-conspirators. So you can use the the confession of one against the other. They're not that. So you just using it doesn't make any sense. The state's threshold argument that Hemphill's failure to present his claim adequately to the state court should prevent the court from deciding his federal law challenge to a state court decision is rejected. Hemphill satisfied the presentation requirement in state court. At every level of his proceeding in state court, Hempfield argued the admission of the plea allocution violated his Sixth Amendment right to confrontation, as interpreted by this court. And once a federal claim is properly presented, a party can make any argument in support of the claim. So he did properly preserve his claim. So he didn't lose it. So he can use it. The Confrontation Clause of the Sixth Amendment provides a criminal defendant the bedrock right to be confronted with witnesses against him. In Crawford versus Washington, OG original hardcore case, holla, the court examined the history of the confrontation right at common law and concluded that the principal evil at which the confrontation clause was directed was the civil law mode of criminal procedure, which allowed the use of ex parte examination as evidence against the accused. The, the civil law system has different evidentiary standards, including the admission of ex parte evidence. So not so much with that.
The Crawford court reasoned that because the Sixth Amendment does not suggest that any open-ended exceptions from the confrontation requirement to be developed by the courts, the confrontation guarantee was most naturally read to admit only those exceptions that existed at the time of the founding. This is how we typically interpret constitutional rights. We typically interpret them as they existed at the time of the founding. So what is the confrontation right? What is the right to confront one's witnesses? Well, it is the right to confront one's witnesses. So as always, what do we have to do? We have to do a historical analysis. As the Supreme Court recently reminded us in Second Amendment land, it's no different in Sixth Amendment land either. We have to do a historical analysis. We have to find out what did the right include? What doesn't it include? What exceptions such that they are applied? Because if they weren't recognized as part of the right, then they're not within the confines of the right. So yeah, we have to go do and do a historical analysis to see what was allowed for or not at the time. Because the framers would not have allowed admission of testimonial statements of a witness who did not appear at trial unless he was unavailable to testify and the dependent had a prior opportunity for cross-examination, the court rejected the previous reliability approach the Sixth Amendment described in Ohio versus Roberts, which had permitted these admissions and statements of unavailable witness so long as the statements had adequate indicia of reliability. So yeah, before uh, Crawford, which was relatively recent, it's like 20 years old or something like that, if that, the Supreme Court used to allow a lot more statements against you. And then they decided that was kind of dumb because the Sixth Amendment. The court rejects the state's contention that opening the door rule incorporated in People v. Reed and applied here is not a confrontation clause exception at all, but merely a procedural rule that limits not only the manner of asserting the right, not its substantive scope. While the court's precedents do recognize the Sixth Amendment leads states with flexibility to adopt reasonable procedural rules that bear on the exercise of defendants' confrontation rights, the door-opening principle discussed in Reed is not the same class of procedural rules. The door-opening principle is a substantive principle rule that dictates what material is relevant and admissible. The state would have trial judges weigh the reliability or credibility of testimonial hearsay evidence, but that approach would negate Crawford's emphatic rejection of reliability-based approach to the Confrontation Clause guarantee. Here, it was not for the trial judge to determine whether Hempfield's theory that Morris was the shooter was unreliable, incredible, or otherwise misleading in light of the state's proffered, unconfronted plea evidence, nor was the evidence reasonably necessary to correct the misleading interpretation. So, yeah, basically, this is just an extension of Crawford. Crawford basically gave you an enhanced right to confront your accusers, and it's relatively recent in Supreme Court history. Before that, the leading case on point, Ohio versus Reinhardt, said, yeah, basically, it's just whether or not sufficiently reliable. So this was basically where hearsay exceptions came into play. And the Supreme Court said, no, you actually have a right to confront your witnesses because that's what the Constitution says. So unsurprising. So therefore, it is not therefore left to the trial judge to determine whether or not, you know, it's good or not. These decisions have been made. And so since he's unavailable to testify and be cross-examination and has never been cross-examined, his, his confession can't come in, it is an unconfronted statement in the context of this trial. The court also rejects the state's insistence that the Reed rule is necessary to safeguard the truth-finding function of courts because it prevents selective and misleading introduction of evidence. The court has not allowed such considerations to overrule the rights of the Constitution that it confers to criminal defendants. And none of the cases the state relies on for support involves exceptions to a constitutional requirement. The state's concern that reversal will leave prosecutors without recourse to protect against abuses of confrontation right is overstated. I, I'm not sure how you can necessarily abuse something that's technically a right, but okay. Well-established rules of evidence permit trial judges to exclude evidence if its probative value is outweighed by certain other factors, such as unfair prejudice, confusion of the issues, or potential to mislead the jury. Finally, the rule of completeness does not apply here, as Morris's plea allocution was not part of any statement that Hemfield introduced. The court does not address whether and under what circumstances that rule might allow the admission of testimonial hearsay against a criminal defendant, because, yeah, it was not something that he introduced. So if Hemfield had introduced part of the statement, then maybe, but he didn't, so no. Thus, that brings us to the end of the case of Hemfield versus New York, a case that is describing further the right of confrontation. You have a right to confront the witnesses against you. 
the Constitution says so. Uh, somewhat unfortunately, until relatively recently, the decision in Crawford, uh, this right was not as broad as it should be. But now the right is much broader as it should be. And so now this is just further extending out that logic. This guy has some testimony that might be relevant to the prosecution. It might be very relevant to the prosecution, but he's not available for testimony because he's not inside he's not inside the country anymore. So they can't just merely offer his own confession against him. If Hempfield, the guy being charged, had offered parts of his statement, then maybe from rules of completeness, sure, but he didn't. He's objecting to it every step of the way. And so no, you can't actually argue that offer that statement against him. So that makes total logical sense, is in accordance with the Sixth Amendment's clear text, and at least for the moment, brings us to the end of discussion of this case.